Hey there friends, my name is Lauren and I'm the maker behind Vintage Knitting Party. I created Vintage Knitting Party because I came across my first knitting pattern from the 1940s and I just fell in love. I just thought it was so beautiful. I thought it would be so easy to incorporate into my wardrobe and into like the clothes that I normally wear. I already wore a lot of vintage inspired clothing. Uh, it doesn't quite suit my lifestyle for me to wear true vintage all the time, but I think it's so easy to incorporate vintage knitted garments into a modern wardrobe. And I just started collecting patterns. Soon I had too many to be able to just keep to myself. And I started sharing them as PDFs because I think that's a really easy, accessible way to get access to vintage patterns. It's very cheap. They're easy to look after. They're easy to find. And on a lot of websites now, including mine, you can actually sort by size, which I find really easy to do. There are some that are easier, some that are more difficult. Uh, you know, we have more ability to share these types of patterns than we ever have. And I love seeing people all knit the same vintage pattern and sharing their ideas and tips and tricks just like they would with a modern pattern. And that type of community is exactly what I wanted to make with Vintage Knitting Party. So I have a personal agenda. I would love more people to knit vintage patterns. I think they're beautiful and there are so many wonderful skills that you can learn from them. So if I can create any content that helps you guys access the vintage patterns and makes them seem a little bit more achievable and a little bit less intimidating, then I'm definitely going to be doing that. I almost exclusively knit from vintage patterns these days and it's actually so much easier than you would think. So I wanted to create a video just sharing my fundamental basic knowledge of how to use and interpret vintage patterns to make it a little bit easier for you as well. I suppose I'd like to start off just by sharing that the term vintage is very, very broad. For the context of this video, I live in Australia and a lot of the patterns that I'm able to access were printed here in Australia from Australian wool mills and designers. A lot of the patterns that I will be talking about as well are from the 1940s. It's my favourite decade to knit from, but I do dip into the 1930s and the 1950s as well. Anything after that from the 1960s, 70s and 80s is even easier to interpret than these and they're much closer to what we see modern patterns as today with multiple sizing, much more comprehensive instructions on materials and things like that. Uh, some of those patterns are even also knit in the round as a lot of modern patterns are, whereas a lot of older patterns are knit flat, but we'll get into that. Prior to the 1930s, vintage knitting patterns are just a little bit different, so I'm not going to be talking too much about them today. They are still easy enough to access if you know what you're looking at and if you've had a little bit of practice at knitting. We're going to be mostly talking about patterns from the 1940s or thereabouts. I have an example that I'm going to be sharing with you today from Patterns and Baldwins, uh, which was based in Tasmania at the time of printing. And this pattern book is from the 1940s. There are some beautiful, beautiful patterns in here. And I thought it would be a really good example uh, for us to go through. So we're going to be talking about a couple of different categories in order to interpret your vintage knitting pattern. First up, we're going to be talking about how to read the vintage knitting pattern in the first place um, and you know where to look for different types of information and what you can expect from a vintage pattern. We are going to be talking about the materials, the sizing, and the construction as well. I'm not going to go too much into individual techniques and different knitting stitches because I think that uh, they just vary so much pattern to pattern and a lot of stitches and techniques are actually also found in modern day knitting patterns as well. So if you have some experience with knitting, you might actually find following a vintage pattern easier than you would initially think. Now let's have a chat about how to read the vintage pattern. As you have a look through your vintage pattern book, you may notice a page, it's, it's mostly at the back, with some important information. There are often little tidbits included in here like, you know, what yarn to buy, uh, the tension that you should follow. I've seen some pattern books that even include instructions on how to knit, how to purl, and how to do some other basic stitches. Uh, this one in particular has abbreviations. 
And not every pattern book will have them. If I am making PDFs from a pattern book that does include these details, I tend to include them in every single pattern, even as individual downloads. If you get your hands on an original knitting pattern book, it can be really useful to have a look through this little glossary, I suppose, of abbreviations, just to make sure that the abbreviations used in vintage patterns are going to be similar to what you're used to using in a modern pattern. Now as we look into the individual pattern itself, you will notice that usually there is some information before the pattern begins. You want to have a look at the name of the pattern and make sure that it lines up with the picture that you're using because they tend to be a little bit all over the place in these pattern books. Now as you go through the vintage pattern, they are generally laid out with uh, the title, some brief explanation perhaps of what the pattern is about, and then you have your materials including yarn, measurements, abbreviations, tension, and then the instructions for each panel. Now in this particular pattern, the first category before the actual instructions is the materials. Let's have a chat about what yarn you should be using for your vintage pattern. It may be frustrating to read this part because all of these yarns are obviously going to be out of production. Uh, this pattern book is 80 years old, so no one is making that wool anymore. But it will give you some information about the amount of yarn that you will need. In these patterns from the 1940s, they almost exclusively use fingering weight yarn. There are some that are made for chunkier yarn, there will be some that are made for lace weight yarns, but for the most part they say fingering weight, three or four ply. Now three or four ply vintage yarns are not always exactly the same as our current fingering weight three or four ply yarns, but if you go by the tension, you should be able to really replicate what that vintage yarn would look like. I have found that most vintage patterns use a tension of 7.5 or 8 stitches to the inch in width. It is essential to swatch, I believe, for vintage patterns. I know that not everybody loves to swatch, but I promise you it will help so much when it comes to making sure that your pattern is the right size. It can take a really long time to work on a fingering weight sweater, and the last thing you want is to finish it and then find that it is the wrong size. Sometimes the instructions for the tension will be a little bit different, however, as in this pattern, for example, where it says that it's necessary to work at a tension to produce four patterns to three inches in width. So for that, you're just going to have to to read the pattern instructions and knit a swatch in the stitch pattern that it recommends and then measure it and make sure that it works. Obviously when it comes to buying your materials that can be a little bit more frustrating because you won't know whether it's going to work until you buy uh, a skein and knit it up. I would say as a general rule going to seven or eight stitches in an inch in width as a tension guide is, is appropriate or between 28 and 32 stitches per four inches or 10 centimeters. Sometimes when you're shopping for yarn, it has, um, it has different measurements in the tension and the gauge recommendations. But there are a lot of um, baby yarns, sock yarns, different fingering weight yarns that are going to give you a very, very similar gauge. So you don't need to stress too much about it. It sometimes just takes a little bit more research and preparation to make sure that you are buying the right weight and you get the right gauge for your pattern. The other materials that they recommend will be the size of knitting needles that you need and then anything else like embroidery floss, buttons, zippers, um, crochet hooks, everything like that. I find that a lot of vintage patterns recommend that you use a UK 12, which is a 2.75 millimeter needle and a UK 10, which is a 3.25 millimeter needle to use the smaller size to knit for the ribbing and then the larger size to knit for the body of the sweater. This pattern just recommends a UK size 10, which is a 3.25 millimeter noodle, which is really handy that you just need one set of needles. I use vintage knitting needles when I knit on my vintage patterns because I just love the way that they are designed. I often use the plastic ones. I feel like they're nice and slippery so that I can easily slide my yarn around and I can knit quickly without too many, you know, too much tension in my wrists. But at the same time, they are grippier than metal needles. So uh, my project doesn't just fly off of the needles unless that's what you're going for. When it comes to reading the instructions, it will generally guide you row by row. Most vintage patterns that I have found 
not only are they knit flat but they're actually knit from the bottom up and you will often start with ribbing at the bottom and then you will move into the pattern you will knit up and up and up sometimes increasing and then you will get to shaping the armholes where you'll you know you've knit up the body and then you start to cast off some armhole stitches you knit up a little bit longer and then you start to shape the shoulder somewhere in there you may also have some shaping around the neck I have seen some people who are very experienced in knitting vintage patterns who recommend that you knit the back piece first because it you know if you're still getting the hang of the stitch or uh, or if your tension isn't quite right if you've just had a little bit of a break from knitting uh, because you won't see the issues in the back piece as much as the front I noticed that most vintage patterns actually recommend that you knit the front first so I suppose you could choose. Generally it tells you how to knit the front, how to knit the back and then how to knit the sleeves. So this pattern for example includes instructions for long sleeves as well as short sleeves and it also has instructions for shoulder pads. Then the last uh, step of the instructions is how to make up the jumper. Most vintage jumper patterns like I said are knit with a front, a back, and then the two sleeves, they're fairly straightforward. Sometimes there'll be a neckband in there as well. Sometimes there's decoration. Sometimes there's extra frilly panels and things like that. But for the most part, vintage patterns are all knit flat from the 1940s at least. Some of them will use double pointed needles for things like socks, mittens, hats, sleeves, etc. But for the most part, they are knit flat and then you will need to join them using a mattress stitch. Mattress stitch is super easy to do, it gives you a really seamless finish. I actually find the seaming process quite meditative and I really enjoy it, so I wouldn't let seaming put you off. It's actually really easy to do and it can feel really gratifying to knit flat pieces because I feel as though you just really get to see the garment coming together and it's just terribly exciting. Mattress stitch, like I said, is very, very easy to do. Just have a look at some YouTube tutorials. Some knitting books even include a little bit of instruction on how to seam things together. Some patterns will tell you how to make shoulder pads and I think shoulder pads are always a good idea. They're so much more flattering than you think they're going to be. A lot of 1940s sleeve heads are built with a bit of volume in them and they require a, a shoulder pad to really fill that out and make them look a little bit less flat, if that makes sense. And I don't think they should be skipped. Now let's have a talk about sizing. <laughs> Vintage knitting patterns are notorious for not being size inclusive at all. There are a couple of reasons for that. Obviously, fat phobia is one of them. <laughs> um, and the fact that uh, bigger people obviously have always existed, but um, a lot of knitting and sewing patterns were just not very inclusive and not really designed for that. I think the main reason, however, is the fact that most people knew how to knit and sew and therefore resize their patterns. So a lot of patterns will just include instructions for a 32 inch bust. Some of them are 30 inch, some of them are 34. Some of them include multiple sizes, which is really exciting. If you're ever shopping for vintage knitting patterns on my website, on vintageknittingparty.com, you can actually sort by bust size, and I have sizes all the way up to a 46 inch bust, which I know is still not terribly inclusive, but it, you know, if you're not feeling like you wanna do the maths to resize a pattern, then it's nice to sort through them and know which ones are already going to fit you. When it comes to resizing patterns, it can be a little bit, it can be a little bit of a craft, I would recommend that you knit a couple of modern patterns before you knit a vintage pattern, just because I think you can get a handle on how garment construction works, uh, what type of fit you prefer, if you prefer something with negative ease, something with positive ease, and you'll also kind of get an idea of how the sizing works and where you have to include extra stitches and where you don't in order to make a bigger size or a smaller size. Once you figure out your tension, you can use maths to resize a pattern. Obviously, if your um, tension is eight stitches to an inch, for example, if you knit an extra eight stitches on the front and the back, you're going to end up with two extra inches around the bust. So it's not always that straightforward, <laughs> to be fair, especially, I guess, for example, in this pattern, you would have to figure out how many pattern repeats fit into an inch and then uh, figure out how many extra inches you need around the bust and try and incorporate that. And then there's, 
often increases in the body up from the ribbing so you kind of have to do some backwards math. So it, it can be a little bit finicky but once you've done it a couple of times I promise you it's not that bad. If you're interested in a more comprehensive guide on how to resize a vintage pattern I would probably need to make a dedicated video for that just because I think that there are so many different ways that you can do it and there are so many different examples that I might need to run through it in a couple of different ways and that would definitely require its own video. While we're talking about sizing and tension and things like that, I do feel as though it is worth mentioning that you really need to make a fairly decent sized swatch when you are looking at these patterns and then you also need to block that swatch. There have been many times that I have knit a vintage pattern and I've almost thrown the project away because I thought that it was just too small, I thought I must have done something wrong with the tension and my maths, and you know, it, like because it's a lace pattern, it's like this crumpled up little panel and I look at it, I'm like, how on earth could this possibly fit my body? But then as soon as I block it, it just doubles in size and it stretches out. If you are halfway through knitting anything and you are worried about it being too small, I would give it a steam block and then uh, see whether that helps at all. There is absolutely some assumed knowledge in vintage knitting patterns. For example, I've come across some jackets with like a drawstring hood and it just says make a cord to, you know, go into the drawstring. And I just think there are so many different ways you can do that. Like, are we making an eye cord? Are we crocheting some chain? Are we... You know, like, I don't even know, are we just using a cord? So in some ways I think that's good because it gives you the creative ability to be able to decide what you would like to do in that situation. But if you're an absolute beginner, it can feel a little bit challenging and a little bit intimidating. So for sure, there is some assumed knowledge in these patterns, but for the most part, they're actually not too bad. The ones from the 1940s onwards, they're still fairly clear in their instruction. Sometimes they will have some things like just make buttonholes or cast off, and it won't tell you like what cast off or cast on or how to make a buttonhole to use. But I think whenever you endeavor to make something like this, you just have to remember that Knitting is made up. A human made this. We discovered that if we use two sticks and a piece of yarn and we make a bunch of different knots that it can be functional, we can make patterns out of it. We've made this up. Like there are very few things that you can do wrong. I know that there are some things that work better than others and some techniques which hold up better over time or suit different weights of wool and that is totally valid. Really I feel like there are very few things that can go completely wrong in knitting where a garment will be completely unusable. Especially as a beginner, you are totally allowed some leeway. You're allowed to be inventive and creative and piece together knowledge from many different places. So I hope that that helps ease your mind a little bit when it comes to vintage patterns. They can be a lot of fun. There are a lot of really interesting constructions and interesting garments and lots of like wonderful little snippets of history that are locked away in them as well. Now it has just started to rain here and by the looks of things it's only going to get heavier so I'm going to wrap this up uh, but I hope that this has given you a little bit more information on how to use vintage knitting patterns. Obviously they are all different so if you've ever tried one and you felt like it didn't work for you please try another one. It's always worth giving it another go. I am always here to answer your questions if I am able to. Uh, there is a huge vintage knitting community on Instagram and every single person who I've come across is so lovely and so helpful. Uh, so I think that if you put your questions out there, they will definitely be answered. And you just have to trust that the more you practice, the better you will get and the more you will understand uh, what you prefer in a vintage knitting pattern. Um, I know that there are some styles that I love and some styles that I will probably not knit again and that is totally fine. I think these patterns are beautiful and I think that they're definitely worth keeping alive and keeping in circulation. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you've um, picked up something about a vintage pattern that you may not have known before. I would love if you've ever knit a vintage pattern in fingering weight wool for you to share your best option for yarn in the comments below. I have a couple that I prefer to knit with, mostly Cascade uh, fingering weight sock yarn, I think gives me like the perfect tension. And I have also knit with secondhand yarn that I've gotten the right tension with, that like eight stitches to an inch kind of gauge.
Um, and I've also used baby weight yarn before that has worked out really well for me. Um, but I'm in Australia and I know that some things that I can't get access to are really, really good options um, that other people are able to get access to. I know that everybody's uh, tension, like when they're knitting, is different. Some people are tight knitters, some people are loose knitters. I tend to be a little bit more on the tense, tight side. Um, but I would love for you to share what your preferred yarn for vintage patterns is local to you. Perhaps even share your country or city that you're in so that other people can find the right yarn for them. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you next time. Bye.